Corsair's A500 has been an embarrassing show of performance for the company's first revisit to air coolers in a long time. But the upside is that it makes for an excellent showcase of some of our new testing equipment and methodology. We recently unveiled our new testing methodology for CPU air coolers going forward, primarily focusing on updates for air coolers, but also adding in some changes for liquid coolers. This is our first set of data to begin building those charts, and we'll rapidly be adding to it over the next month. The updates include about $10,000 worth of dummy heaters that we designed with an engineering firm, plus the cost of the power supplies that drive them, but also it includes heavily revamped real-world testing. In this benchmark, we'll be looking at the Corsair A500 dual 120mm single tower cooler versus the Noctua NHD15, not the D15S, but the D15, and the Deepcool Assassin 3 with some other coolers for quick reference. Before that, this video is brought to you by Gigabyte's X570 Master Motherboard. The X570 Master is what we use for all of our Ryzen 3000 CPU reviews and for extreme overclocking streams with the 3900X. The Master is built to handle more current than you'll push through your Ryzen CPUs. It has actual finned heat sinks for the VRMs, and it features a massively overhauled Gigabyte BIOS. Pick up the X570 Master for your Ryzen 3000 CPU at the link in the description below. So this is the cooler. If you want to know more about the testing methodology, we have a piece that's more than 30 minutes long talking about it. We've also got an article that went up with it, and those will be linked in the description below. It's important stuff. A lot of CPU cooler benchmarks especially by the community and comments, are done incorrectly. So we've spent basically six months really heavily refining what we have done over the last three years. So that's all important. You should know that stuff. We're not going to talk about methodology here. We've got a full video for that. All right, so the cooler itself, it is $100. The Noctua NHD15, for reference, is $90 at the time of filming. The Deepcool Assassin 3, with its false advertising changes to the Amazon page, is down to $90 as well. So that puts this $10 premium for smaller fans from a less proven manufacturer in this world. And we'll have to see how it does. Now, a couple of things immediately. I'm not going to do a whole build section on this, but the top comes off. It's just an aluminum plate, basically. And it's really only there to try and make it easier to install the cooler. Everyone else on the market has figured out how to do this without eliminating 30% of the surface area of the product. But this one cuts a big giant hole in the middle that's, well, I mean, you could very nearly fit another fan in there. This is, it's kind of going back to like Tunique style cooling, if anyone remembers them. And there's a reason that they're not in business anymore. So that's the top plate. The fans were pointed out to us as being specifically worked on for the ease of positioning. And we will give Corsair credit here. They did a very good job with the positioning, uh, the, the plastic slides for the fans. But it's also not that hard to use a metal rail. It's probably a whole hell of a lot cheaper. And that's probably the $10 difference you see as a consumer. So other than that, there's really not a whole lot special. There's a, a lot of things that went kind of poorly or were suboptimal. The bottom, for example, this one is not one of the catastrophically bad units, but it's one that should represent the average. We also have two of these. And I can feel just with my finger the difference in height between some of these heat pipes. It's direct contact, there's no cold plate, it's, there's not like an accept or jack setup. It's just direct contact. And we tested the delta in service levelness on this using a service levelness meter. We'll talk about that in today's review as well. So at $100, it really prides itself on an ease of installation. It's gone 120 mil fans instead of 140. Apparently this is so that Corsair can fit in a wider variety of cases with shorter height clearance, but uh, overall, I mean, the only thing that's really restricting you there is going to be memory clearance with something this big. So they, they could have done it otherwise. Anyway, there's no RGB LEDs. We give it credit for omitting that. It probably pained Corsair to do so. And uh, I think that's really all we need to go over. For methodology, check the other content. Let's just get straight into numbers. We're going to talk about the surface levelness first and then go through thermals. Our first chart will likely be one that you haven't seen in a cooler review before. We'll show some cold plates and B-roll first before putting the chart on the screen. The chart will show a scatter plot of depth measurements taken with a precision surface levelness instrument that we purchased. The instrument is calibrated against a known small square of perfectly flat tempered glass that came from the calibration company that we worked with. The gauge measures depth from a known zero point, so we're able to see the delta from one measurement to the next across the cooler's surface. This allows us to find microscopic imperfections in the surface of the cold plate down to microns of differences. We take the measurements clockwise from a chosen top left corner of the heat pipe if it's exposed or the cold plate if not, and then move around, then inward. What we're looking for is 
basically equidistance point to point. So we want to see consistency. It's effectively impossible to have mass-produced, perfectly flat cold plates and perfectly flat heat spreaders. Otherwise, we would never need thermal paste. But we're looking for as close to a zero delta point to point as is reasonable. Here's that new chart. The Corsair A500 immediately illustrates what will become its weakest point throughout this review. It's unlevel and inconsistent in its unlevelness. Part of this is assuredly attributable to the exposed heat pipes, while the rest is a result of manufacturing tolerances. Corsair sent us two A500 coolers after we voiced performance concerns and rejected the advertisement that they wanted to run for the A500 on the basis of those bad results that we saw. And the company noted that it had significant manufacturing defects in the first run, but claimed that it was only applicable for the press samples. We tested both, one of which was the newer sample, and do not believe our units to be affected by the specific manufacturing defects that Corsair says included a deformity in the heat pipe that would be visible by the naked eye up to one millimeter in depth. So we're unaffected here. We didn't see anything that bad. It was still bad, just not there. The second unit exhibited much the same levelness as the one we have here. Corsair ranges from about seven microns to 77 microns with point-to-point -point deltas chaotic across the axis. The Noctua NHU-14S is a lower-end, single-tower, single-fan cooler that is overall more consistent in its levelness. The Deepcool Assassin III is the most impressive of both thus far and has nearly perfect deltas for several of the measurements, with several data points at 15 microns. The AMD Wraith Prism Revision C is also clustered centrally. Note that manufacturing variation run-to-run -run will impact single-unit outcomes, but we err on the side of caution since we'd anticipate review units should be more likely to lean towards the good end of production batches. Also, we have two of them and they're about the same. Corsair's A500 has more variation in depth from a known zero point than its tested competition. And that's true against both units. Thermal paste will have to fill these gaps. And considering the average thermal compound ranges from four watts per meter Kelvin to maybe eight on the high end, while copper runs closer to 400 watts per meter Kelvin at 25C, this puts Corsair's manufacturing at a disadvantage. You want as little thermal paste as possible between those two interfaces. Our next chart normalizes the noise levels to 35 dBA between all of the coolers. It's easy for any CPU cooler to get to the top of the chart by running 100% RPM with loud fans, but that's not impressive. You could just brute force your way there with a faster fan, and people don't have tolerance for jet engines that close to their heads. We have 100% speed charts next, if you really care, but 35 dBA establishes who has the most efficient cooler design and eliminates for overbearing fans. Note that 35 dBA doesn't actually mean anything in a vacuum unless you take the measurement at a set distance and with a known noise floor, as noise meters are extremely sensitive to any minute distance changes, and a lot of reviewers will leave out the information of how they took the noise measurement. You can't just randomly point it at the cooler. You, you need a process. So we take our measurements at 20 inches from the front of the fan, it's 26 for the noise floor. The wind is never directed at the meter because this would invalidate the result. And the noise floor of 26 dB would be about equivalent to a suburban house with the AC off, without any street noise, and without much inside noise. It's quiet, in other words. Separately, remember that it's all about how much power is being pushed into the cooler. For the first chart, it's about 123 watts. We'll test the 3950X later with more chiplets and higher power consumption at about 200 watts for some additional heat load. Time to get rid of the B-roll again and put the chart on the screen. So this is 35 dBA for an R7-3800X overclocked with the Corsair A500. As stated earlier, we're starting with a limited set of coolers while we build out our new CPU cooler test bench. For this one, the Noctua NHU-12S is present only to establish a floor for a weaker cooler that's still improved over stock. That's at 61 degrees Celsius over ambient, so that have you into the 80s on an open air bench and towards the 90s in a warm average computer case. Our ambient temperature is a heavily controlled 21 degrees Celsius and is monitored every second of the test with less than plus or minus one degree. The Corsair A500 equipped with relatively inefficient 120 mil fans measures at 56.5 degrees over ambient for the 123 watt EPS 12 volt load temperature. The Noctua NHD15 is within error and is effectively equal at this power load, but we'll talk about why that's not a good result for the A500 in a moment. The Assassin 3 is also within range. All of these coolers, including the single tower NHU-14S, are about the same in performance on the 3800X when tested in this environment. It's simply not enough power load to load the bigger coolers, and so we lose test resolution and the ability to establish the small differences there are. Essentially, 
you can think of this like benchmarking a CPU with a load which isn't sufficiently CPU intensive to illustrate differences between two parts that are otherwise very similar. This isn't thermally intensive enough to really draw out the difference, but it's still useful data. That's all okay though, because a lot of people will use their CPUs and their coolers this way. So it's still useful to know for someone who isn't into overclocking. The 3950X has significantly better heat flux. It's got reduced voltage requirements against something like the 3800X, 3900X2, which means that there's a nonlinear scaling of cooler performance against stock CPUs. The 3950X will be easier to cool than a 3900X in some instances, but you're still dealing with more cores, so keep that in mind as well. We used our custom-made dummy heater to rapidly prototype our theory that a higher heat load would throw the results out of alignment for the most part. And once we confirmed our thoughts, we moved everything over to a 3950X real world test. You can learn more about our custom engineered dummy heaters on the GN Steve secondary channel. These are units that we spent some time on and a lot of money on to work with the company to build them out for us. All the same rules apply here, but we're now at 198 watt heat load on a 3950X, which has an extra chiplet versus the 3800X. Note that we previously disproved the belief that the heat pipe orientation against chiplets matters it's a different thing entirely. That's not why we're switching the CPUs. We're switching them to get higher power consumption. It's only, only relevant here, uh, the chiplet difference, because it spreads the heat differently than the 3800X. So we only have three coolers on this chart because it was just added for this test specifically, but we'll continue building on it as we add coolers. In this limited chart, we've established that the A500 begins to deviate more from its competitors. The NHD15 and Assassin 3 remain within test variation and error of one another, and so are functionally equivalent. The Corsair A500 begins to fall behind, exiting error and marking a difference of 2.7 degrees Celsius load and about the same for idle. This doesn't change the world in any respect and honestly wouldn't really matter in a practical sense. But there's also just no reason to buy something that's objectively worse, especially when cheaper, better options exist. Corsair's A500 is a weak showing for the company's first revisit to air coolers. Our dummy heater allowed us to test that the A500 continues to fall behind as the heat load increases further, but we're not able to easily test this on a real-world deployment since the processor begins approaching stability limitations at temperatures nearing 90 degrees Celsius T-Dye. This would only really start to matter on something else, like Intel HEDT, where the gaps should further widen in theory. But theory only matters so much with these. Just don't buy something worse on purpose. It doesn't make sense. This chart is for auto frequency results, meaning we've eliminated our frequency control. Eliminating fixed frequency control puts frequency back into the hands of Precision Boost 2, which means that we deviate from pure thermal numbers and begin to look at a metric of frequency scaling versus performance. You must control the frequency to have accurate thermal measurements but we can use this for a different metric. If frequency goes up, heat will go up, but two coolers with the same temperature aren't necessarily the same performance. Frequency might be higher on one of them. It might be boosting higher because it's cooler. We still control voltages and fan speeds with this one set to 35 dBA and 1.237 V core get or 1.063 V SOC get, but frequency is left to control contingent upon thermals. In this one, the A500 runs equal to the Noctua NHD15. Both are within error of each other. The Deep Cool Assassin 3 ended up about 40 to 12 megahertz, and so carries a 0.36% uplift over the Corsair A500. These are basically the same. None of these three big air coolers make much of a difference for frequency, at least, at least not from each other. But they do have noise implications covered elsewhere in this content. For perspective, the stock AMD Wraith Prism Revision C at 35 dBA ends up at around 4100 MHz, so we've got a 2.4% range top to bottom. Remember that an average of all core frequency does mean that the 100 MHz here and there will add up to materialize and potentially larger differences than a simple arithmetic delta of the average all core number. Also note that we're running the voltage lower than the motherboard does by default. So boards that push higher voltage will chop more off the top of the auto frequency scale. This chart will show the 3800X again, same settings as before, but now with a 100% fan speed for each cooler instead of 35 dBA noise normalized fan speeds. This means that we deviate from the controlled fan speed and coolers are allowed to run however loud they want. We've added dBA markers next to each cooler's name to help us and you identify where each one lands for noise as well as thermals. Corsair gets absolutely embarrassed here. Although it's at the top of the chart, you really need noise for a perspective. It's just sort of depressing, really. Corsair's single tower dual 120mm cooler has to run at 2350 RPM and 51.1 dBA to equate the Noctua NHD15 at 1500 RPM and 43.9 dBA. That gets you the same thermal results. Remember that noise is logarithmic. So 
the increase in volume is nonlinear. Every 10 dBA is about a 2x increase strictly in perceived noise to the human ear. This is a rule of thumb measurement for a subjective matter. Please note that we are not talking about acoustic power, which scales differently, but rather purely perceived noise to the human ear. The Deep Cool Assassin III, in spite of its false advertising, is still a better cooler than the Corsair A500. It's not better than the NHD15 here from an efficiency standpoint, but it's a lot better than the A500 at 46 dBA and the same thermals. Of course, considering that the NHU14S is within 2 degrees at 39 dBA, none of these coolers look very good with this platform. We'll need to move to a higher heat load to see differences, and a lot of that will be numbers that we look at in future videos. We're really focusing on the big coolers versus each other today. The 3950X chart doesn't establish much in the way of thermal differences this time, but that's because they've all been configured to compete with the NHD15 specifically. Noxua's cooler is the oldest here, and each of its competitors on this chart marketed to press that their products would match the D15. In this respect, it's no surprise that there's not much distinction at full fan speeds. We'll need to get some smaller coolers on here in the future and better determine how much an NHU14S might fall behind versus the 3800X charts. Even still, once again, Corsair's A500 ends up as an embarrassment here. It has to run significantly higher noise levels in order to achieve parity with its competition. Again, there's just no reason to intentionally buy something objectively worse and more expensive unless you like the look, and Corsair doesn't really fit that bill either. So the conclusion for this one, there's really no reason to buy something that's just objectively worse even if it's only a couple degrees and heavily controlled tests. The whole point of doing testing like this is to try and find a difference. And does 2.7 degrees matter? Well, not a whole lot, but also if you, well, for one thing, the noise profile of the other coolers is much better. This one gets a lot louder and it doesn't gain anything for that noise. That's really the downside. A lot of the time when you have something that runs super loud, like annoyingly loud, it also has more headroom for performance. But this one doesn't. It falls off. It levels out about where the D15 does at significantly lower noise. So there's really not a lot of reason to buy this because you're not even getting extra headroom for overclocking with the higher fan speeds. You're getting the same thing for louder. And if you run them noise normalized, then the others are a bit advantaged at higher power and heat loads, but they're equal at a, let's say, 120 watt load for the 3800X or something like that. The scaling will increase as you move to HEDT parts. If you happen to buy an Intel HEDT part, you really should be avoiding this one. But even then, it's not massively different. It's just that it's different enough that it's not worth buying. And maybe you buy it for looks, but there's not a lot of that going on here either. So really what this is, is this is Corsair trying to make a product that it can sell in its pre-built computer ecosystem that it is trying to spin up to compete with NZXT's build. That's what this product is. Because there's not a lot of reason to buy it in the DIY market. So uh, this, this is one where you know we, we exercised our right that we reserve with all advertisers with this particular product because Corsair asked us to run an ad for it which is completely fine. That is within the ad agreement. They can ask us what products to run ads for, but we can also say no. And so after we had tested this one, we said, you know what? We just don't feel comfortable running ads for this. It's not good enough. It's not, it's not objectively bad, but it's bad in a sense of relative comparison, which is all that really matters. So uh, we re rejected that and ran Hydro X ads instead. But anyway, this thing is not something we can recommend right now. It has surface levelness issues. It's not the main issue, though. Uh, it's one of them. But fans are another one. The noise profile is not good. It is not competitive in noise normalized performance. And it's not really a looker either. So at least not in a unique way that matters. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching our first jump back into CBU air cooler reviews in years. We spent a long time getting back to this point because we've become so paranoid about data accuracy over the years. We know enough now to know the, the flaws in testing, and that obviously makes it a lot harder to do because you start knowing enough that it slows you down. But we're there now. So thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get access to bonus footage. You can subscribe to the GN Steve secondary channel as well if you want to see the uh, behind the scenes video we did publicly for our new dummy heaters and store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly if you'd like to help us in making more videos about stuff like this. We'll see you all next time.